Welcome to our first program for environmental ministry here at New Song Church. We are so pleased and proud today to have with us two astute environmentalists from our community, Jen Davis with the City of Henderson, Tara Pike from University of Nevada, Las Vegas. They'll be sharing their insights and advice for us as we approach and celebrate the 50th anniversary for Earth Day 2020. But a little bit of background for you. In 1970, the governor of Wisconsin, Gaylord Nelson, launched this idea that he had to have an environmental day nationwide. At that time, in the late 1960s, there was a growing movement, anti-war movement, but there was also an emerging reality that connected pollution with public health. There was a growing awareness about wildlife extinction, oil spills, water pollution, and how, yeah, it linked to the health of our public. It took hold. I was witness to those days. And even more personally, I'm proud to say that my father worked with Gaylord Nelson that year. He was stationed through the Fish and Wildlife Service in Governor Nelson's office. And so he was part of that effort. And I remember hearing all about it. It was a special time. But now, now we fight a new war, don't we? COVID-19. And we grapple still with how to be stewards of our earth that's been created and blessed and entrusted to us. It's so timely now to equip ourselves with deeper awareness, abiding practices, how we honor this creation. So we have with us today, Jennifer Davis, who is the environmental officer for the city of Henderson. She has deep experience in environmental permitting, environmental field work, water quality sampling, stormwater, and data analysis. Ms. Davis has prepared environmental and planning studies for the public as well as private sector. She's worked with consulting firms, engineering, and municipal agencies. She received her undergraduate degree in environmental studies at UNLV and currently pursuing her master's in environmental and occupational health. We also have with us Tara Pike, and Tara is the founder and current manager of the UNLV Rebel Recycling Program. She started this campus recycling program 25 years ago as a senior project. It's amazing that it's persisted and grown. Tara is passionate about continuing the, the diversion of food waste, recyclable materials, compostable materials at UNLV. In fact, she was the driving force this past year for the purchase of a composter to process special waste, coffee grounds, and campus food waste. Tara has served on the Clark County Recycling Advisory Committee, and that has led to improved curbside recycling. She's co-chair of the Southern Nevada Christmas Tree Recycling, but now also the vice president of Recyclomania. So we welcome our distinguished guests. Each have a message for us, and then following that, we'll entertain some questions that we have received from the congregation. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Tara Pike. Thank you. Um, so I am very passionate about recycling. And I know that a lot of people in our community are likewise passionate about it. Um, there is a great movement now for our community to have commingled single stream recycling, which has increased um, recycling rates uh, in our city. And I think that that is wonderful. Um, I hope that everybody is looking at what can and cannot go into the curbside recycling bins. Um, but something that I think needs to start to take hold that hasn't taken hold yet is the importance of reuse. So when you think about the recycling symbol, it's three chasing arrows in a circle. And we all know that the first arrow is reduced, the second arrow is reuse, and the third arrow is recycling. And that is honestly how we should be looking at the waste that we generate. First, we should be um, reducing our waste. Uh, next, we should be reusing it. And the third is actually recycle. Um, and so we need to start transitioning ourselves into that mindset, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, and then if you want to really be an eco-warrior, uh, you want to go into looking at rot. And rot is composting. 
Um, a lot of your waste in your home um, at a university uh, is food waste and compostable, non-recyclable paper products. And so something that I am passionate about is diverting that organic material to either feeding pigs um, or turning it into soil. So if anyone's ever interested in learning about composting and reducing and how these things can be implemented in your life, you can reach out to me at the Rebel Recycling Program at UNLV. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. And Jan, we look forward to your comments. Thanks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, conservation, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit about pollutants going out to Lake Mead. Um, so there's a lot of different things people can do to conserve water. Maybe one of the most important things to understand is how much water are you actually using inside and outside of your house. Um, on the Southern Nevada Water Authority's webpage, they have a water use calculator that you can go on, plug in your address, it asks you about the different types of fixtures in your household and about your landscaping, and it'll actually kind of break down what your water use is. That might help you know where better to conserve. Maybe you need to upgrade fixtures or something like that. Um, another thing to do is, especially outside, um, where is your water going outside? About 60% of the water use is used outside, not actually indoors. Um, and as Tara kind of alluded to, that doesn't get what we would say recycled. Water in your house gets more recycled because it's going to a wastewater treatment plant where it's cleaned and then goes back out to the Las Vegas wash in Lake Mead. Water outside doesn't go through that same process. It just goes down a storm drain if it doesn't get evaporated first um, and then goes straight out to Lake Mead. Um, so grass, for example, is a great way to help conserve water. SNWA has a turf conversion program where I think they pay $3 per square foot up to $10,000, or I'm sorry, 10, up, up to 10,000 square feet. Um, and they have an estimate that I think if you convert a thousand square feet of grass in your yard, that can save up to 50,000 gallons of water per year. So what does that, what does 50,000 gallons really look like? If you have a pool that's maybe 25 by 50 feet and five feet deep, that's a little less than 50,000 gallons of water. So that's a lot of water that you can be saving just by converting some grass. Um, Making sure that you're adhering to the watering restrictions, those were really put in place to help conserve water. Um, we're in the springtime right now, so that's March through April. So watering days are three days a week. Once we hit May through August, watering days go to, um, you can't water between 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. So really adhering to those. Um, there are penalties associated if people aren't adhering to those. So that's a way to, not have to pay extra money because you're watering on a wrong day or time. So that's really ways to conserve water. Some other things that residents can do is help um, reduce pollutants that go out to Lake Mead. Um, again, I mentioned that water that's used outside just goes straight into our storm drains and straight out to Lake Mead. There's no treatment. And Lake Mead is our primary source of drinking water. So what residents can do around the house, if you're cleaning out your garage or your driveway, make sure really to sweep that. Don't hose it down because if you're hosing it down, it can pick up anything that's on your driveway. Um, if you have a spill or something, or something that you need really to use water on, use a rag instead of a hose. Um, another thing is chemicals. If you have herbicides, pesticides that you're applying, make sure that you apply those when there's no rain forecasted because if you apply them in the morning and it's going to rain in the afternoon, that rainwater is just going to wash them all off and send them out to Lake Mead. Um, same thing with any paint buckets or anything like that. If you're washing out any paint buckets, washing out, emptying any containers, um, those shouldn't be done in the street in the gutter because that all goes out to Lake Mead. Um, some additional things that residents can do is when you're washing your car, for example, 
if you take it to a car wash, that water gets recycled. And if you wash your car at home, that water is picking up anything that's on your driveway, picking up anything that was on your car, dirt, leaking fluids, um, bird waste, if you had that on your car, and that's all going straight into Lake Mead. Sounds kind of weird that maybe there's dirt on your car that's going into Lake Mead. We live in a desert. What, why does yeah. dirt matter? Um, but the EPA actually considers dirt one of the top pollutants because it infills lakes and rivers. It can contribute to um, bad water quality or affect the fish and aquatic life in there. If you are going to wash your car at home, um, making sure definitely that you use a hose with the nozzle so water isn't just running down your street. Um, using a soap that is biodegradable or doesn't have phosphates or petroleum products in it. Um, some other things that you can do around your house, also when you're fixing your car, um, never pour used oil down the drain. Don't just let it sit out in a container. The sun will beat up those containers and then it'll just leak. Um, take it to an automotive place um, or with oil or actually if you're trying to get rid of chemicals, Republic Services has a household hazardous um, program so you can look on their website and find out what the dates are for those to take those chemicals and try to dispose of them properly. Uh, just a couple other things. Um, every, lots of people have pets making sure that you're picking up after your pets. Um, when flash floods occur in the valley that water can be as swift as 30 miles per hour. So if you think about all the pet waste that's on the ground that can definitely get picked up in stormwater and get passed down to Lake Mead. Picking up dog waste doesn't mean just using a bag and dropping it back on the ground. I don't know if you've seen that. I've seen that a lot around hiking trails. Picking up that bag, making sure that you place it in a trash can is important. And then I guess the final thing that I would probably say that residents can really do to help um, prevent pollutants is if you're having any sort of construction going on at your house, whether you have painters inside or a pool being built, making sure that those contractors, again, aren't washing out their brushes outside in the gutter. Um, any excess materials that they have, they're properly disposing of it. If you're building a pool and they have concrete, making sure that they're taking all that excess material with them and properly disposing of it. When you're draining your pool, if you're, it's, you need to drain your pool, make sure that you drain it to a sanitary sewer. Um, SNWA on their website has several pictures of what your sanitary sewer might look like. Um, because again, if you're just draining it to the curb and gutter, that water can pick up anything in its path and take it out to Lake Mead. And same thing with your pool filter. If you're cleaning your pool filter, kind of clean it in an area where you'd be able to sweep up anything that comes off of it and place it in the trash can. So I think um, it's a, probably a lot of information, but a lot of things that maybe people haven't thought about before. Very much so. I like the idea of having to go to a car wash. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that that's actually advisable. Yeah. But that you're right, a lot of resources, a lot of information. Um, it creates a, a, a greater awareness. And sometimes those of us, we can get a bit baffled, daunted. Um, is there, I'm just curious if there's any advice you would have for how to begin or, you know, what have you experienced of prioritizing, you know, so that we can begin to look at our personal practices, but not not feel overwhelmed. Any insights? One thing that I think is important to state is that one person can make a difference. Um, I think that a lot of times people will not take steps to, you know, conserve water, um, reuse items in order to avoid creating solid waste um, or garbage or recycling. Um, and they just think that they're just one person, it doesn't matter. But it does matter, and it, the reason it matters is because over our many days, weeks, months, years, um, everything you do adds up. So while you might not see it, it is adding up, and it, it, you are individually making a difference. But more importantly, what you're doing will be noticed by other people. 
and then other people will start to emulate your good habits, um, your good environmental habits, and then, then they will start to do it, and then other people will see them, and we have that pebble in the pond effect where it ripples out. And now, um, carrying your own refillable container, carrying your own silverware, I have all my props here, um, starts to become the norm. And once it becomes the norm, and we're, we're all collectively doing it, now we're making an even bigger um, difference. But it has to start somewhere. Um, you know, you, you hear a lot that Las Vegas is a very wasteful community. We're a wasteful community. That is how we're perceived by a lot of the world, honestly. And it's unfortunate. You know, I get people saying to me, why do you live in Las Vegas? You would fit in really great in Portland. And this is true. I would fit in very well in Portland um, because a lot of the things that I do are norms in Portland. But I need to be in Las Vegas to help create this sustainable shift, this cultural change um, where we are doing the things that they're doing that help every day. And so I think the biggest thing is, is to maybe take on Take on something that you can do, you know, like I didn't always have a refillable mug. I didn't always carry my own silverware. Um, but I would once a month pick something to do and I would do it for 30 days and then it would become a habit. So um, a habit is created after doing it for so many days where you consciously think about it and say, okay, I can't forget my reusable container today. But then once you do it for about 30 days, now it goes into your unconscious habit, right? And it's just, you just do it. I don't leave the house without it because it's part of what I do now. So I say, pick something, start doing it. Once it becomes an unconscious habit and it's just something that you do, um, pick something else. So, and create this cultural norming and sustainable shift that we need. You touched a little bit on it, but I'm curious to ask you, are there any cost savings associated with being eco-friendly? Are we just creating more work? I think water is a good one. I mean, I have a lot of cost savings, but let's start with water because that's an important one in Southern Nevada. Um, in the city of Henderson in particular, your water bill is a tier structured. So what that means is the more water you use, the more expensive it is. So the more you can serve, the cheaper it will be. So there's a cost savings right there with your utility bill. Um, so that's something I don't know if people are aware of. And it would affect everybody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And of course it's the same for energy. The less you use, the less you pay. Very important to conserve energy. Um, and one of the things that a lot of people in Southern Nevada aren't going to know is that the water district is the biggest user of energy. So when you conserve water, you're also conserving energy. And that's because if you leave your water running while you brush your teeth, the pumps are pumping that water to your house for you to just run it, um, which is energy. And then the pumps are pumping the water away from your house. <laughs> So there's a lot of energy involved in delivering water to our homes, in cleaning our water so that we can use it again. Um, so when you conserve water, you conserve energy, which of course, if you're conserving energy, you're creating less carbon. Um, so it's all connected. And then in terms of my passion, solid waste, um, you can save a lot of money by uh, reducing and reusing the items that you probably don't even think about. So I don't buy paper towels. This COVID-19 issue for paper towels and wet wipes and all that has not affected me because I use, um, you know, reusable cleaning rags at my house and then I wash them. Um, some of the other things that I'm not doing now because of COVID-19 is um, I carry this with me everywhere. This is my um, reusable container. It's very large because I, I drink a lot of uh, liquids <laughs> living in Southern Nevada. But when COVID-19 is not a thing, I can actually refill this at a 7-Eleven, um, 
you know, for the water dispenser there on the soda fountain. Um, when I go to fast food restaurants, I'll say, hey, charge me for a refill. I'm gonna hold up my container and they'll be like, okay. And then I don't get charged um, because they don't have a refill button on there. But I do save a lot of money with not buying convenience store water, not buying convenience store soda, um, just not buying not beverages. Right, so I'm not creating the plastic. I'm not having to get, take it home and recycle it. Um, and I, I do save a lot of money. Um, you know, at UNLV, we have a refill program. It's called Rebels Are Refilling. And if students carry their own refillable container and use uh, any of our 100 hydration stations, they don't have to buy water. And if you bought a bottle of water every day while you were at UNLV and you added that up, you're probably saving somewhere between $300 and $400 a year in not buying bottled water. So there is a cost savings to refilling. Um, there is a cost savings to not buying paper towels. Um, and there's you know, many other things that you can think of that if you found the eco-friendly alternative, you would, you would probably save money. The one question that we received that uh, um, strikes me is why? Why should I care? This program now, 50 years, and it's big, mm -hmm. but why? I think that you, when you talk about why you should care about reducing um, your waste, recycling your waste, um, conserving water, conserving energy, uh, creating less pollution in general, because all of these things do create less pollution. What you're really talking about is caring for several generations past you. Um, you know, I personally think that the marketing director for uh, the environmental movement back in the 70s mislabeled what we're trying to do. They said, save the planet. And, you know, that's a great slogan. It makes, it, it resonated with me, uh, which is why I went into environmental studies and do what I do, um, because I care about being a good earthling. But really what we're doing is we're saving the humans. Um, this planet is going to continue to revolve and continue to do its thing, even if we're not on it. So we're not trying to save the planet. We're trying to save the resources, the air, the water, the soil, for the humans and the other animals, the other earthlings. Um, I think that as kind of the earthlings with the big brains and the opposable thumbs, it's up to us to care about the other earthlings from you know, the magnificent elephant and gray whale down to the you know, um, lizard living in a cave. I mean, we need to take care of all of them. That's our job. Um, so it's about saving the humans so that we can help save the rest of the animals. I would say we've heard about the levels at Lake Mead getting lower, yeah. um, so we need to conserve water to maintain them. They could possibly be a lot lower if we weren't doing the conservation that we're doing mm -hmm. now, but there can always be more. Um, Lake Mead is our primary drinking water source. It's a recreation source. We have people that swim in it, that fish in it, that boat in it. And why would you not want to protect it if you're enjoying it? Mm -hmm. And how dependent we are on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're depending on it. Yeah. I mean, we can't exist as a community without Lake Mead. We just wouldn't be here, so. I guess I'm hearing from both of you, you know, we want to motivate our communi community to move toward these practices, not out of fear, right? but out of community. Yeah, and out of enjoyment. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. community, love. Preservation, I would say the biggest thing is love of our children and their future children, um, because really that's what it comes down to, is what are we leaving for the future generations of humans and animals? <laughs> Absolutely. It actually leads into um, first thanking you for your time, your insight, your commitment, uh, and it shows in the work you do. Uh, we're just very grateful for you to be part of this initial program. 
um, and sharing with us. Um, we know that Earth Day is actually not just a day. Um, it is a week that they celebrate and honor and inform, but hopefully it's a daily practice. Dr. Martin Luther King said it well. It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one destiny affects all indirectly. We are interconnected, aren't we? Mutually sharing this earth. And during this COVID-19 time, we have to pause. Maybe some people would call it a, a forced interruption, a disruption, but it is an opportunity where we can consider our personal practices, our habits, and how to take care of each other and our earth. Here's to Earth Day. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.